So here we go. This is the next webinar about object-oriented programming and uh, the webinar number... I always keep forgetting the number of the webinar. This time it's it's 40. The webinar is 40 and we're going to discuss decorators. This is a quite powerful and um, design pattern and quite powerful instrument in object-oriented programming which I keep promoting for a few years and uh, I start sounding like a broken record because every time I, I start speaking about object-oriented programming it's always people are well I, I'm always getting into decorator pattern and uh, people start now start uh, blaming me for uh, overusing this pattern and you know there was a story in a few conferences where uh, they even didn't want to hear my talk anymore because they said that uh, I was already mentioning that many times and that every time I, I speak about object-oriented programming, I end up uh, making examples where there's a, a long list of decorators and objects are being decorated into objects and decorators into decorators. And that's people are thinking that this is like, you know, the same story over and over again. So that's why, maybe that's why this webinar today, because I will try to demonstrate you the real example of decorators. I'll show you how they actually help me uh, make the code better and make the code more uh, uh, cohesive and uh, make uh, classes less coupled and smaller and, and better. So a little bit of the theory before we start showing some code. I can even open the, the, new, vin the new window. Uh, the idea of decorator is that we want our objects to be small in order to be maintainable. That's the whole point of everything I'm preaching about object-oriented programming. The whole idea is that the code has to be smaller, the, whole, the code has to be uh, shorter, and that's how you achieve maintainability. So let's say, for example, I... Uh, I have a, a class. The, the, today I'm going to be using Ruby, which is a programming language which I'm coding more right now than Java. I was doing Java for years, now I'm doing Ruby. So that's why the example in Ruby. But it doesn't really matter. So let's say you have, uh, you have this uh, class wallet and the wallet is something where people actually keep money. And then we have a method uh, which we call, let's say, add some money. So pretty easy, and then we do some, I don't know, increment the balance, and then save the balance, whatever. Something happens inside the wallet. That's pretty short, and if this method is just a single one, and the implementation is short, the class is maintainable. Every time you open it, you understand what's going on. The question is, what do we do when we want to extend the class, when we want to add something to the class and make it bigger? Well, let's say, for example, for example, I want uh, I want the money to be always less than fifty dollars when we add that. So my first option is to say, okay, here's the requirement coming in from the from the customer, and I want to make sure that every time the money comes in, they're smaller than fifty dollars because we don't want to allow a user to add. Okay, let's let's put it this way: it's always positive. So we want only positive amounts of money. We don't want to de deduct any money. We only want to allow to increment the, the balance. So what do I do if I'm the traditional programmer with the procedural, procedural mindset and I am just ready to put the code there and, and be happy with that? I'm saying this. If money more uh, less than zero, then raise an exception you can't add negative amount pretty good right that's the the straightforward approach the decorator will make my code i'm just showing it to everybody who doesn't know what decorator is i'm showing uh only positive wallet which is which encapsulates another wallet this is the constructor initialize uh, the wallet okay 
the wallet and then I'm doing that's a constructor where I actually encapsulate the provided value variable and uh, in the end of course I'm doing whatever I'm saying wallet equals to wallet new and then wallet add some amount I don't know for example $78 so the traditional approach would be this yeah like I said to to add these three lines to the code which obviously makes the method longer it was let's say two lines or maybe I don't know how many lines would be here maybe 50 lines here and it was 50 before and now it's 53 so every time we add new code the the class grows the class becomes longer and that's I think why we have in many libraries we have so many large classes because people are they don't understand how to break down a larger class into pieces they just keep growing they keep increasing the size of a class and then eventually it grows up to thousands of lines of code because they don't understand the decorator pattern I think so it's one of the key patterns which we need to understand so here it comes only positive wallet add money and then I say wallet add money and I don't touch the original wallet so now I have the original wallet untouched it works like before and I have a new class which is a decorator which I'm going to use like this only positive wallet new so now my wallet is decorated by only positive wallet class and then when I called add 78 first my call gets in here and then the checked validates the value and then it calls the encapsulated wallet and I can add the functionality this way up to no limit let's say tomorrow I want another class and say uh, every time the wallet gets a new payment into it I want to log this transaction I want to put the line into console I want to report about that so how would do it if I would be the, the normal traditional programmer I would say log info okay let's put it simple puts a new payment arrived that would be the tradi traditional approach and as you can see we grow the length of the method it gets longer which is bad which is not what we want our methods to uh, to be we don't want to be longer them to be longer we want them to be shorter so instead of that I create another decorator and I call it I don't know uh, logging wallet again the same story it encapsulates the original wallet and then it does this and it does that and now when I want to use them all three together I'm saying logging wallet new now I have three objects the original wallet which as you can see is not touched it's still the same the same core functionality and I have the logging functionality here and I have the the checking validating functionality you may say that look the amount of lines here is way more way uh, bigger then if we would be just you know taking it here put it here right here and then this and that, that's it that's it call it a day so we don't need that many classes look boom the code is shorter it looks like that it, it looks shorter overall code but if you look at the complexity of this method it's it's larger it's it's more complex than than with this approach so by splitting functionality into multiple classes we obviously increase the amount of them the number of classes we obviously have more of them but the complexity of each of them is way lower look this is quite simple and look at this method this is quite simple and now I will show you the real example from the Zold uh, library it's a cryptocurrency we are all, we are all working on right now uh, I will show you like practically what happened there and why I needed decorators so I hope we're clear uh, up to this point I hope you understand what decorators are for you can read a few articles on my blog just Google just uh, search for the decorator keyword and you will see the explanation I think it's very important and now let me show you the 
the real example. So in my code, I have wallets. It's a container of, it's not a container, but a holder, a storage of wallets. You know, wallets for the, for the cryptocurrency, wallets of the users, which keep the data. So I have the class, which is called wallets. And uh, it has a constructor and it has a directory where all the wallets are stored. And each wallet is a file. So it's pretty easy. You know, that's a storage of wallets. It has just a few methods. One, two, three, four. Four methods. This one just, you know, presents it as a string. This one returns the path where these wallets are located. This one returns an array of all the names of the wallets in the container. And this one gets access to one wallet for the client. If the client wants to modify the wallet, then this method actually has to be called and then the access will be granted to one particular wallet. Just four methods, pretty simple. And then I got a need. I, I realized it was a few months ago that uh, if multiple clients from different threads start getting access to this, you know, to the, to the, to the wallets and they start modifying those files, then there could be collisions. You know, because from multiple threads, if you modify the same file, sooner or later, you will get broken content in the file. So I need synchronization. I need some, you know, some mutex, some locking, which will prevent two threads at the same time making changes to the same file. So I want this method, which is a CQ from acquire. So I want this method, which is supposed to acquire a, a file, uh, you know, disallow multiple threads to, to call at the same time. So I want synchronization. I want them to do it, you know, sequentially instead of parallel. So how would do that? Again, the traditional approach would be to say, okay, let's introduce some mutex here. Let's do some synchronization in this, in this, in this uh, method. So let's increase the size of this class. If you look at the unit test of this, uh, of this class, it's pretty, you know, this is the unit test, which is, which already tests the functionality of, of the wallets. So I understood that adding the feature right into this class would be a wrong approach because that would make the class longer. That would make the, 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 the that would make it, uh, less cohesive and less focused on one particular feature which it has to provide. You know, I'm not a really big fan of this single responsibility principle, which uh, you most probably know what it is, where uh, it is claimed that the module, which is a class or something else, but in general, a module of a software has to be responsible for one thing, for one, you know, one functionality. Uh, I, I find that principle quite vague. It is, it is, you know, it, it has too many potential, too many possible meanings and too many uh, open ends, which difficult to define. So what is one feature? Uh, what it is a module? Is it a class or a collection of classes or maybe a group of classes? So I would stay away from that strict definition, like single responsibility principle. But I am more for the definition of cohesiveness. So cohesiveness is... Basically, the, the ratio or the metric which determines uh, of how many how many things or features or how much functionality your class is responsible for, and it will never be single. You can never be able to say that my class is single responsible responsible for a single thing because look at this class. Is it is it uh, you know compliant with the uh, us with the, um, the single responsibility principle? I don't think it is because look, there are four methods. First of all, not a single method, but four methods. This one makes a string. This one uh, returns a path. This one is returns a collection. And look, it's, it goes through the directory. It filters something. It, it, it makes some filtering of the content. So it does something else. This one actually gets access to this class. So again, some new functionality. So it's difficult to, to put the border and say we are SRP compliant or we're not compliant. That's why I'm suggesting to use a more uh, professional metric, which is cohesion or how cohesive uh, your class is. So, and, and, and there are many, there are many metrics, there are over 
30 or something metrics which uh, may tell you how cohesive your class is and and basically and this one is pretty cohesive that's my point that's why that's why i explain you the cohesiveness that's my point it's pretty cohesive because um you know there are, there, are, there are many metrics and they all are dancing around uh, most of them are dancing around the relationship between methods and attributes so look at it here we have just one attribute and we have methods which all this or that way work with this attribute so that's why it's cohesive so this attribute is used here look it is used here it is used, uh, it's not used here, but it's, the method pass is used, which is also using the method, the, the, the attribute, and it is used, the pass is also used here, which goes to the dir. So they're all, all of these four methods, they're all connected to one attribute, meaning that the functionality is dancing around the same concept. That's why it's cohesive. If I would introduce a mutex here, you know, mutex in in um, in Ruby is the lock, the synchronization lock. Then I would say here, mutex. For example, it's primitive, but still, synchronize. Do that would synchronize everybody around one mutex, and then the cohesiveness will drop, because look, this method doesn't need the mutex. The method pass doesn't need the mutex. The method all doesn't need the mutex. Only one method is using the attribute mutex. That immediately drops the cohesiveness matrix because there are two attributes, four methods, but only one of them is using this attribute. Meaning that the attribute mutex and the method ACQ, they are something separate from the other three guys. See the logic. That's what cohesiveness is about. So I, and it also, increase, it also increases the, the, the complexity. It always decreases the maintainability because it's a new functionality. The synchronization is something new, which is not, first of all, it may not require in all cases because maybe not always we will need multi-threaded environment. Maybe there is not always will be multiple clients using the wallets. So the bottom line is that I decided not to touch this class at all. Just leave it the way it is. That's the wallets. It is not thread safe. I can even put uh, the comment here and say this class is not thread safe. So I, I commented and I say it doesn't support you know thread safety. So it's up to you if you break it. But I introduced another one which is called sync wallets, which is standing for synchronized wallets. Sync collection of wallets um, and I can say this is a decorator for the wallets class as a comment and look what's happening it encapsulates the original wallets the functionality which implemented somewhere which is implemented somewhere it encapsulates the timeout for synchronization there is some logging for uh, for synchronization and there is some directory for for the locks for the files which are used as locks So there are four things to encapsulate you see we're building something new It's a it's a you know com more or less complex system for synchronization these four methods They are not They're thread safe. They're all they are they are fine Because they are not modifying anything. So that's why they're thread safe so this one doesn't modify anything, it just returns the string. This one returns the pass. This one finds all the wallets and returns them. They're also not touching anything, not modifying. So what we're doing, we're just uh, sending the calls through and they just go to the, to the encapsulated wallets. And then here in the, in the method acquire, we are doing the, the synchronization using this um, class from another library, which is, uh, which is, uh, look, there's even a bug I see here. This timeout is not used anywhere. So that's that's the parameter which we don't need. Look, we can remove it. See, while I'm talking to you, I found a bug. So what's happening here is this a locking functionality. We lock somehow. It doesn't matter how, but I'm showing you that, that this locking functionality and synchronization functionality is moved away 
from the original class. That was the original functionality. I didn't touch it. I created new synchronized wallets. And now the functionality is the complexity of this class is lower and I can test it separately. Look, and I have a special test for it. It says test sync wallets. So here I'm testing exactly the thread safety of the implementation. In test wallets, I'm testing the original functionality, like how it works, but without any threads. I'm just testing how it can manipulate the files. While in test synchro synchronized wallets, I'm testing specifically for, for the multi-threading uh, problem. So I'm, I'm making sure that it can handle 100 threads and not break. So that's... That's the idea. That's the idea of segregation, two pieces of functionality into two places. And that's a pretty simple example. Now I'll show you a more complex example. But I want to be clear up to this point that instead of injecting new features into existing class, I'm always trying to think how we can do it through the decorator. So the decorator is a tool, it's an instrument, which I'm using everywhere. Again, I don't want to sound like a broken record and keep saying it again and again, but that I think is the core, the core uh, pattern which you should apply in object-oriented programming. You need to have many, many decorators if you want your code to be uh, simple, if you want your code to be testable, if you want your code to be small, if you want it to be short. So look at this class. It's quite short. It's like, what, like 20, 20 lines of code or 40 lines of code. And it is, and it is, it does what it does. And I can make more of those classes. And I'll show you many more. Uh, so let me close, let me close this example. So we are done with this one. Yeah, I can, I can add one more probably. So I, I also, there was another problem, and I wanted my wallets to be cached. So every time I get the wallet from the disk, it has to be parsed, and it takes time, and I don't want to do it again and again, especially if I keep working with the same wallet. I don't want to download it from the disk and parse multiple times per, per second. I wanted to cache it in memory for some time. So I, I created another decorator and I called it cached wallets. It's another decorator. It also encapsulates the original wallets. And it again doesn't touch these three methods because there's no need to do with them. They're fine. They're just being, uh, being uh, you know, the calls are just transferred to the original um, the original object and then what I do here is I do something for the caching so here again the, the, the piece of functionality is small it's easy for me to understand how it works it's easy to test it's easy to debug everything because it's small if I would get that functionality and move it to the original class and the for synchronization as well that would be a large piece of code which I would have big problems understanding maintaining, modifying, and uh, testing and debugging. And let's see how these guys are being wired together in the, in the actual production code, because now we have three guys, three decorators, well, two decorators and the original object wallets. And let me show you how they are being put together. Here, look, I say wallets equals to sync wallets and then cached wallets and then just wallets so i create an object that decorate well this is the original object wallets and then i decorate it with cache wallets and then i decorate it with the sync wallets and pay attention that i sometimes use another object tree wallets so sometimes i want to decorate somebody else usually i decorate just wallets but in some cases when it's a node command then I use three wallets, which have a completely different implementation of this, you know, wallet management. But I still want caching and I still want synchronization. So I reuse my code. So the decorators, they help me to reuse the, the features and functionality which I already implemented. I don't want this caching functionality to implement here as well. I don't want to, the synchronization to implement here as well. So that's why decorating because I can decorate many different things in the same way. Even though Ruby doesn't have uh, interfaces and it's, 
it's pretty weak, not very strong object-oriented language. It doesn't have many important features like interfaces, for example. Uh, that's why I can give basically any anything here. So I can give this cached wallets anything as an argument, and that will make um, that will make uh, the code break most likely. Uh, but still, in Java, of course, that will be easier because uh, I would uh, I would have the all of these guys would be you know would extend the same interface. There will be interface wallets somewhere, and I would have like default wallets, tree wallets, cache wallets, sync wallets. They would all implement uh, the same interface. But in Ruby, it's just it's just uh, you know whatever you can pass will be decorated. And now to a more complex example. I'm not going to go through all of it, but let me show first how it looks on the surface. Uh, there you go. Let me scroll it down. And here it is. That's a... That's a Russian doll of decorators. We have the thing which is called entrance. Entrance is something which accepts all the incoming push requests for the node. So there is a, in our cryptocurrency there are nodes like servers and when the server is running it waits for HTTP uh, push requests of new, wall, of new wallets. So if the wallet comes in it has to be pushed and the entrance is, is as a class which accepts new incoming uh, wallets. So the entrance is you can look at the entrance first. So let's see the, how entrance looks. That's, that's the class which I started from. So I started to design from the class entrance. And, uh, and it's pretty complex. So look, this is the push method which accepts the, the ID of the wallet and the body of the wallet and then does some calculations. It, it, it somehow you know, puts together what's coming in. It merges something. It cleans something after it. And then it calculates and it some, records some statistics. And, and that's it. So that's already a pretty complex piece of code. But then a new requirement started to come in. For example, the synchronization. So I realized that I don't want multiple wallets to come in and, uh, and come in together at the same time. So if somebody pushes me the same wallet at the same time, I don't want to run that procedure uh, at the same time. I want them to go one by one. So I want to somehow sequentially put them in the sequence, put them in the line. And then how to do that? So I created a decorator, which is called, oops, which is called sync entrance. And it has the method push, which as you can see, is using something like we, we are using in the, in the synchronization for the wallets. Again, it, encapsul in the, it encapsulates the original entrance. It doesn't touch these two methods. They're like, you know, the same. And it, and it synchronizes the push call. Pretty easy. It's easy. But it's, it's a separate class. And then I realized that, look, uh, once the wallet comes in, once I get it in, and, and, and do some processing for it. I want to send it to another node. I want to send it, I want to spread it over the network. So the wallet comes in, I like it, I merge it, and then I want to send it to all the nodes I know, all my neighbors. Okay, there is spread ent entrance. It's another decorator. Again, it, it encapsulates the original entrance, and there is a new functionality for actually spreading the content over the network. Look, here it is. It is another piece of complex code. Look, there's some, some method push, which does something. I run some background thread. It's another 100 lines of code. And I don't want that 100 lines of code to stay together with that lines of code here. Because that's already complex. So I wanted to put somewhere. Where? In a decorator, which is called spread entrance. And here's how I create it. I create spread entrance new. I decorate into another decorator. And then I say, okay, I don't want my wallets to come in and I, want, I don't want the client to wait until I do all of this, until I uh, merge, you know, do all these manipulations and then I spread that wallet over the network. That will take me like, you know, maybe half a minute. I don't want the client to hang on a line 
on the push request and wait for me to do all these operations. I want the client to push me something and just walk away in, in like half a second. So how do I do that? I create another decorator which is called asynchronous entrance. And what it does, this asynchronous entrance, it's another implementation of the method push, look. And what it does is that it stores the content into the file and then it puts into the into the queue, you know, in memory, like for the future processing, and immediately returns something. And then I have a background thread which picks the files from the from the from the uh, from the storage from the disk, and and does all of that operations in the background. Another piece of functionality which will which takes like a hundred lines of code. That's another decorator called a sync entrance. And then I realize that look, I don't want people to, to, to send me the content, if the content is coming in and I already have the same, exactly same content on the disk, then I don't want to, I don't want to run this full procedure again. I just want to tell the client that, okay, that sounds good. Thank you very much. I'm not interested. So I created no duplicate entrance, no dupe entrance. Another, you know, a few lines of code, which does something, calculates the, the digest, uh, you know, some uh, some hash checksum and then compares the checksum and ignores if the checksum is exactly the same. And then I realized I have two more. And then I realized that I don't want to, you know, spam. I don't want to uh, my clients to send me exactly the same content uh, multiple times while I'm still working on the same stuff in processing. And I created no spam entrance. And then the final one, safe entrance, I want... I don't even remember what safe entrance is for. I think it's for reporting. So safe entrance, yeah, safe entrance, uh, it's kind of a validating entrance. So I don't want the, the wallet to come in if the wallet contains some errors. For example, the wallet is coming from a different network. So we are in the main network and there's a, from a test network. And if there are protocols mismatch or the balance is negative, all the kinds of you know validations before I can say, okay, I'm going to accept the wallet. So I created a safe entrance. So now look at what's going on. I create one, two, three, four, five, six, seven objects. And they all encapsulate one another. Seven. You can imagine how large would be my object entrance if I would, this, if I would put all of this functionality into the object entrance. And that's how people do that, actually. If you open... Yeah, look at your code. When I, when I open the code for, you know, many open source libraries I'm using, they're all the same. People are, they keep growing files, keep growing classes until they reach the point where they become unmaintainable. Because they cannot, you know, they cannot break them correctly into pieces. And the way to do it, I think, is through decorators. Because, you know, why this decorating is, is a good thing you know, think for me is a good discipline for me is that every time I create an object, I'm always trying to think, how will I decorate it later? Will I be able to decorate it? Will it be easy for me? And, and I'm, often, I'm often trying to create decorators from the beginning. When I'm just starting the design, when I'm starting to put pieces together, I'm making those classes and I'm, I'm always thinking how I would decorate and I create a few decorators, trying to put pieces together and trying to see whether it will be possible. And it will not be possible if classes are too large. If classes are big and there are so many methods, and, and if they're mutable, that also you know, very often makes a problem. If they're like really mutable and they change their attributes, that makes it you know, sometimes difficult to decorate. So I want my classes to be small, I want them to expose two, three, four public methods, and that will make it possible for me to decorate them later. Uh, so that's basically what I wanted to explain, because you know what, why I wanted this webinar, why I wanted to show you that, is because people are often complaining about this, this Russian doll, this tree of decorators. They, 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 find it, they find it difficult to understand, even though I find it easy to understand. For me, that that code is easy to understand. I know exactly what, what to look at. I, I look at the name. I look at the name. I understand that there is some new functionalities there. Just new, completely standalone piece of functionality. And if I want to debug any of them, 
you already probably understand that I have a unit test for each of them. I have a unit test for this, I will have a unit test for that, and I have a unit test for, for each of them. I unit test them separate. I never test this whole thing together. Well, I test, but only on an integration level. So if I want to test this whole thing together, then I run this, this entire code in the unit test or an integration test, and then they go together. But I prefer to first of all test them individually. So every time I create a new decorator, I create a new, a new unit test for it. So let me see your questions. I think you have one because that's basically what I wanted to show. That's what I wanted to demonstrate. Maybe you have questions and I'll be able to answer them. Uh, oh, can you please increase the font size a little bit? That's a little bit too late. Uh, we are too late on that. Let me let me read further. Uh, what do you think? Another question. What do I think about abstract fabric? Do I use do you use that pattern to build such nested objects in case of logging wallet? Abstract fabric. You mean I I think you're talking about abstract factory. Uh, well, I, I don't see why I need this abstract factory at all. I know about the factory pattern, but I, I've never used it in the last few years. People keep telling me that, that, that why, I mean, what, what I think about abstract, about the factory pattern, but I don't know what it's for, to be honest. I, I know, well, I know it's what it's for, but in my case, I, I, I don't see a place to use it anywhere. So my recommendation is not to use it. Um, Another question, I've done insane layers of decorators in my project last semester uh, using C++ templates and type erasure. The code turned into a swamp, but adding features to a class was incredib incredibly easy. Exactly. Well, your classes will be, if you follow that approach, if you do it like I showed you with the decorators and small objects, your, your individual objects will be very easy to understand, easy to debug, easy to unit test. Of course, putting that all together and wiring this whole big picture will be, uh, well, I wouldn't say difficult, but that will be the most interesting part of the job. That will be the most complicated, complex, sophisticated uh, step to, 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 to do in order to put your application live. So first you, you design those pieces, then you wire them together, you put them one into another, and then boom, your application works, or it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, my recommendation is not to try to make it work as a whole, but again, take pieces apart and again write unit tests. So every time something breaks for me, I, I'm trying first of all to find who is the potential, uh, who is the candidate, who is the primary, primary suspect, suspect of, the, of the failure, of the bug. And then I find that suspect, I'm not sure who is, who, who is, the, who is causing the bug, but I look at the code, for example, here and I say, look, something doesn't work as it's supposed to work and for example people are sending me uh, wallets and they're being lost they're just not coming in and never get into the database then i say okay maybe my no spam filter is too strong and then i go to test no spam entrance and i see ah uh, you see just one just one unit test which says ignores spam well it does ignore spam but it doesn't check that it actually passes something which is not spam so i'm here testing only the negative case i'm not testing the positive case is it a suspect for a bug it is so what do i do i create another unit test here see i create a unit test i get i i test it if it if it fails great success i found the problem if it doesn't fail i say well I was wrong, I missed, let's try another one. And then I go to another one, maybe this one is not doing it right. No dupe entrance. Test, no dupe entrance. Ignores duplicates, again the same story. I check only how much, how great it ignores something, but I'm not checking whether it actually passes the content correctly. Okay, another suspect, and I test it again. So I go one by one from decorator to decorator and I create more tests, more tests until I find one of them fail. And then I say, wow, great success. I found the problem. I fixed that problem and I run the whole show again. 
That's how I do it. So I never debug at all. You know probably that if you need to debug, then you are not a good programmer and your code is, is not good. So you never debug. You always unit test. So that's how I unit test. I, I look at that pieces individually. And then I test again and again and again until I find the problem. Sometimes I can't find the problem. Then it will take me hours and hours of creating new unit tests and new unit tests. The code base grows. The amount of tests increases, which is great. But I still, they're all green and green and green, no red. That's, that's a frustration. If all my tests are green, but the problem is still there, then I go back to maybe integration testing. And I run this whole thing again. It, it, again, it fails. Then I sit down. I try to analyze, I think, and I think how I can create more tests, how I can, how I can actually break one of those things and prove that one of these guys are actually broken, because they are, if the problem is, is, in, the, is in the big picture. So I hope you answered your, I answered your question. Uh, uh, the question about Futex class. Does Futex mean file mutex? You're synchronizing on a specific file, something like that. Yes, exactly that. That's a Ruby library, which I created like a month ago, which is called file mutex. So it, it helps me synchronize on a file, not on a global mutex, which, which, which holds the entire thread. Well, actually all threads until one thread is complete. File mutex is more fine grained library it's it's based on files which is quite good i'm using it like extensively now and it proves to be uh pretty good uh everyone are doing web apps now not the desktop okay acquire uh uh what kind of wallets are tree wallets well it's a question not really related to this webinar but still uh, i have wallets which are which keep wallets in a just plain directory just one by one all the files together Tree wallets, it's, it's another class which keeps them into subdirectories because when there are so many wallets, for example, right now we have 40,000 wallets on our nodes. So it's not, it's not convenient to keep 40,000 files in one directory. The Linux system will have problems. So that's, that's why it's better to break it down into subdirectories and keep it there. So that's what tree wallets is doing. Uh, by the way, another question. By the way, you should be able to easily create a dynamic decorator in Ruby for forwarding calls from decorator to decorated methods if they don't add anything extra. I know about that. I know that Ruby provides this functionality for the, you know, automatically creating decorators, but I'm not using it. I am not using it on purpose because I think that I'm not sure exactly how it works, but I think it's something like that. It's something like uh it's something like that. If it's sim wallets, then uh, some like decorate or something like that. I'm not sure. And then I can delete these methods. That's, I think, how Ruby allows me to do it. But I don't like it. I don't like it because it doesn't, it hides something from me. I don't see anymore. You know, I don't see the, the what's going on anymore. I don't see the full object. And I, that's what I hate Ruby for, actually, because they hide a lot of things they uh if you look at the traditional ruby code you will see that people are that i as a programmer have to guess in a lot of places like what's going on i don't know because there's so many things under the hood and uh so many things are hidden which you never can well which i can never find out and it takes me you know hours of frustration to to actually understand what's going on because in this case maybe because i'm from coming from a java world but here I know exactly where my calls are coming from. So I know exactly what will happen if I call the method pass on the class sync wallets. I know that it will go directly here. And I know, I, I mean, everything is traceable for me and clear, which I think is way important than this, you know, the absence of these lines of code. Because this code is like, what the hell is going on? That's my question. Like method pass, where it's coming from? I don't know. Well, maybe maybe I'm not just a you know really really Ruby developer. Uh, maybe Ruby developers just just feel it where to look for. But I'm used to this picture when everything is right in front of me. And I would recommend you do the same. So don't cut. I mean, don't don't rely too much on syntax sugar. The less syntax sugar you use, the better. That's my opinion. Uh, the question is again, doesn't this Russian doll structure decrease readability? 
it's i think it's really a matter of habit a matter of personal opinion for me it it doesn't decrease it increases readability it makes the code more readable well we're talking now about this about this uh, these guys so this is my entire entrance to the to the to the application it is all in one place i'm looking at it and i know exactly where my incoming wallets arrive and who is responsible for processing them it's not everywhere spread out of the application i need to you know spend hours understanding where the problem is i know exactly that this is the entrance and nowhere else it's defined it's one place yes it's large it takes me the whole page but it's everything here so i think it's good for maintainability uh, another question how can you test code that combines a lot of decorators together how do you make sure that all the proper decorators are applied in correct order with correct settings well just like i said it's uh, there are two levels of testing first of all i test individually and then when they all stay together i create a, an integration test which runs this full uh this full procedure all together and see how it works it's just two levels of testing on one level we test um, we test these guys one by one and then another level we test them all together i hope i re i answered that question already uh another suggestion maybe rename to validating ent entrance maybe the save entrance could be renamed to validating entrance that's that's possible uh we have Mm, many questions uh you're probably talking about using method missing which i had in mind uh yeah that's some something about ruby features um it could be difficult another question could be difficult to find all decorator because that i like to use the same interface name for all classes entrance with entrance with well maybe maybe it's not a bad idea to start the name with entrance instead of how i am doing so instead of uh, saying uh, safe entrance or no spam entrance, I would say it's possible to say entrance with no spam or entrance no dupes this way in order to make it easier for the developer to find all entrances. So I agree. That's a, that's a good comment. Maybe we'll, we need to rename that. Submit a ticket will do that. I agree. Uh, Uh, my Ruby knowledge is well. That's another discussion. That new, new, new is awful. Object-oriented programming is awful. That's a good comment. But uh, like I said in the beginning of the webinar, if you go for a procedural approach, it will be even more awful. You will have no new, new, new. You will have no this Russian doll thing. You will no have this tree of decorators, but you will have bigger problems bigger problems with larger pieces of code and longer and more time needed to understand uh, how things work another question creating this russian dolls through a factory is this okay from your point of view having to remember all the decorator can be a problem when creating the object I'm not sure how the factory will solve the problem of remembering their names because you still have to remember somewhere which objects to put where and how many of them well their names and their parameters and everything so I don't I don't really understand what the factory is for if somebody will show me the example how that code can be refactored with the factory I will take a look at it but I don't understand how will it help I like the operator new I really like it because when I call new, I know what's going on. I know that the object is being instantiated. When there are some factories and I need to call a method create an entrance or create entrance like this, I don't feel it, you know, better. I feel like my control is out of my hands. I feel like somewhere else will, will create me something. But, but making objects and making instances of objects is the most, like I wrote in my book, is the most sacred moment for every object-oriented programmer 
This is the moment of truth, the moment of triumph. That's the moment where you actually see your code working. So you've been try, you've been creating the class, you've been writing unit tests, you've been, you've been doing all the all the things and designing, and now finally it's the moment of making new, of saying, okay, now make a new entrance. How can we hide that from a programmer? How can we take it out of my hands? I don't want that. Uh, Another question, not a Java developer, couldn't you avoid the code nesting by using something like a compose function where you pass each decorator in a list and compose nests everything? Well, again, maybe it's possible. Of course it's possible, but you will not see how they will get into one another, how they're being encapsulated. So I don't, I don't feel that this is... Uh, this is an achievement, actually. I, don't, I feel like it's a loss of something. It's a loss of control. You, you guys always keep talking about uh, being unhappy with this structure, being like, uh, you know, unsatisfied with this design. But I feel it good. I, I feel like this is the way it should be. <laughs> so I'm trying to convince you that this is a good code. And you're trying to convince me back that, no, let's get back to procedural code and let's back to, you know, flat code where we just wire things together and, and then they just they just magically work i'm trying to tell you that this constructor the bigger it is the more cohesive is your application the more at one place it is instead of being spread over uh, the entire code base think about that uh, uh, we have a few more, more minutes uh, let me read another question how do you mock an external api how do i mock an external api uh well i just mock i uh how do you mock everything else you just create a mock object and that's your external api i guess uh, Uh, the next question, why is this approach better than inheritance? As I can understand, we can achieve same results with inheritance, but we can't mix the order of inheritance levels and use multiple patterns, parents at the same time. You just answer your own question. Exactly. With inheritance, you will be specifically uh, wired and specifically attached to one order of, uh, of inheritance. So one class can only... Well, you will explicitly... While designing classes, you will tell exactly how you, how you want them to, to get together. So there will be no flexibility. You will not be able to, uh, to decorate somebody else with the same fun with the same decorator. They will be just they will be staying together with this hierarchy of classes uh, forever. And it will be very difficult to, to inject something in the middle. Because here in my code, I can easily add something here like this i can i will only you know indent in here and that's it there you go so i can easily inject any new decorator i want so let me get it back before i forgot so this is flexible structure with inheritance it's inflexible and in general i wrote about that i'm strongly against inheritance in object-oriented programming i believe that implementation inheritance was invented by mistake there was a feature which we should not have in, in object-oriented programming we need we need type inheritance we need type we need subtyping that's a good feature subtyping but implementation inheritance it's something we absolutely must avoid. You can read on my blog. Uh, oh yeah, there is uh, my that question was answered, which I just said. Uh, you can use builder with recursively called lambda functions created within builder methods. Yeah, that's true. You can use builder recursively. It's possible. In the end, the result will be the same. You will be decorating and decorating. But yeah, you can use builder, which some people I use. Sometimes I, I have builders for, for that, for, you know, for, for decorating multiple levels. Maybe it will help you too. Uh, does a sync wallet spawn new threads? Yes, of course. A sync wallet is, is, uh, is using a, a background thread in order to, 
you know, in order to, to make the code run parallel, not synchronously. Um, so let me finish. We're running out of time. So I think, I hope I answer your questions. Again, my summary point is that decorators are a key instrument for object-oriented programs. It's not just yet another design pattern. It is the key, the fundamental, the, the, the most powerful, the principal, the number one instrument for any object-oriented programmer. If you do not use decorators, you're not doing object-oriented programming. So that's it, guys. Thank you very much for being in the webinar. We are doing webinars every month on the first Wednesday of each month at 11 in the morning Pacific time. See you next time. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.